This is my TTI EX752M, uh, 2x75 volts DC power supply, which uh, promptly went bang a while back when I was powering a rather silly load. Uh, this is my uh, everything power supply, so I'm not too surprised it's uh, gone bang again. It's, uh, it's a very harsh life. Uh, but uh, nevertheless, we are going to fix it because I cannot live without this thing. Uh, so the circumstances uh, under which it exploded was I was powering my little battery desulfator, this little thing, and uh, this is essentially uh, a boost regulator with no 8-bit filtering. And uh, this thing just generates huge spikes on the output, uh, and while it does have a big cap on the input, it uh, could p potentially cause some uh, stability issues in the power supply powering it. Uh, especially since uh, it's uh, not the most refined of devices, so it could very well have suffered a failure as well. And uh, I want to stop by checking that, because in case this thing has failed, uh, in that the output diode has shorted, uh, this would start trying to put out huge voltage spikes on the input of the power supply, and that's obviously no good. Uh, and that could very conceivably cause uh, a catastrophic failure in this poor thing, uh, especially since the, uh, this is a rather quick power supply, quickly regulating, it doesn't have a big output cap, it just has a hundred mic on the output, so any spikes going into this thing, uh, if it's too fast to get eaten up by a, the snubber diode, it, it, it's just gonna be no good. It's also very high impedance, you cannot uh, uh, feed current back into this, it cannot sink any current at all, say for perhaps a couple of milliamps. So uh, I'm just going to measure the diode on this thing. If uh, that's fine, uh, then I'm guessing the EX752M has just died from old age and heat, uh, because uh, it's a passively cool power supply and it does run rather hot all the time. So perhaps not the best design in that way, but we'll start by checking this thing out. Right, so here's a close-up of the battery desulfator. So it's a very, very simple device. It's uh, paid by a super simple, uh, super cheap uh, Atmel microcontroller, and it just uh, is basically a boost regulator power controlled by software. So it takes power in of a red pin there, which is filtered through this giant choke and then into this rather big cap and uh, after that we've got uh, this switching transistor which will pulse uh, current through this choke which is then uh, rectified by this diode in here and uh, fed to the output. So uh, essentially uh, this diode is uh, the only thing sitting between the huge current pulses and the input of the uh, the whole desulfator. So if that goes short, we have a problem on our hands. Uh, there isn't really any way for this device to know whether or not the diode's uh, in place since it's deriving its feedback from a smoothed a tap of the output. So it just sees a, a voltage on the output and as long as it's what it wants it to be, it's going to keep on pulsing. And well, if it's not what it wants it to be, it's just going to pulse harder. So we'll get a meter in there and see what we've got. So we'll just measure the top side. Uh, that seems pretty okay. As long as it's not conducting the other way around, I'm gonna assume that uh, the desulfate is still fine, hasn't uh, generated any pulses on the input. Yeah, that's, that's fine. So we haven't suffered a diode failure. Uh, we, we have not seen high voltage pulses on the input, uh, which makes it uh, very likely that the power supply has just died because of uh, uh, excessive heat, excessive use, excessive age. So we'll go down that, that troubleshooting route. All right, and here's the inside of the power supply. And in it, I found a tiny piece of plastic flapping around and closer inspection reveals a hole in this transistor, which uh, I believe is a part of the PFC circuit from a cursory glance of a schematic. Uh, and there's just 
bits and pieces ruined all over this section just like this thing's done once before and it was a royal pain to fix so I'm hoping uh, we're gonna get by easier this time uh, yeah gonna have to just measure around check the schematic see which parts are broken it's probably gonna be a shit ton and uh, it could also be caused by an issue on the secondary since it's supposed to be primary side current limited according to the service manual but uh, I, I, I'm not sure if that actually works or if that uh, just causes the PFC circuit to blow up. Alright, so I got the PCB8 and we're looking at the area around the exploded transistor there right there. But look at that! Something's made one hell of a bang there. So I've been digging through the service manual and uh, consulting the schematic which I'm ever so thankful to have and uh, What's happened is we've have an, had an arc over from this point on C14 all the way over to here to R89. And uh, these are two uh, surprisingly, I would think, uh, different, uh, different uh, potential spots because uh, this is uh, pretty much uh, at the full potential voltage of the main rectifier cap. That's about 400 volts and that is why of a component, if you can read that, is a 400 volt uh, a capacitor, uh, and this is what I'm by what I am pretty sure is ground in the same circuit. So we've got uh, almost 400 volts across that, maybe two two millimeter gap, which is way <coughs> way too much. That would not be deemed safe if it were between primary and secondary. So what does this actually mean? Well, obviously it doesn't arc over under normal operational circumstances, so uh, there's been some... something's happened to cause this voltage to go way up. Uh, I'm thinking this circuit uh, hasn't failed uh, due to some operational error on its part. I think it's failed just because something else has just made that huge high energy discharge couple into it and that's killed it. So there's, hmm, uh, sadly it's a bit tricky to read the schematic and look at this PCB since the schematic and the PCB in this particular product don't align at all. I mean these two points are two millimeters from each other in the real world so it's gonna take a while to figure out what's actually gone wrong but uh, reading through some of the application notes for this circuit, thankfully this thing is incredibly well documented and I I, I cannot stress enough, enough how happy I am to have a service manual for it, else, else I'd just be entirely lost getting component level all the way. Uh, the purpose of C14 here uh, is to uh, contain some sort of waste energy which is uh, would otherwise just be lost in uh, the switching of the main power transformer. I'm not entirely certain as to how it works but the gist of it seems to be that it's getting charged up with waste EMF uh, through these diodes. So something would, which would cause an overvolted situation is if uh, perhaps uh, one of those diodes failed maybe or if uh, just something has caused huge losses in the transformer such as a, a switching circuit just going kind of haywire and putting out uh, really short sharp spikes or something which would just result in uh, losses rather than uh, real energy getting carried over to the secondary due to saturation of a transformer or something. Oh, but this is a bit of a pickle. I, I, I think we're not going to have a single failure mode on this thing. Hmm. I'm scared. Now, another possibility we need to consider, because this is just such a huge energy discharge which has taken place there, uh, is that perhaps some bug or something got in there? Because we've got a major voltage across those points even under normal operations, so it's not at, if, if anything, a little uh, fruit fly or an ant or anything got in there, uh, that would go bang uh, with certainty. And uh, it seems to have exploded rather dirtily, there's a lot of soot. And if I look very closely on the uh, solder joints, there's, uh, there are some very large uh, faces which have been 
it cleared off of uh, all oxide when, when it exploded. So I'm going to have to keep that in mind. I'm thinking perhaps I'll just go, and go on a rather blind uh, broken parts chase and see what we can do in case there's just no actual fault in the capacitor circuit here which uh, like if there never was an actual over voltage here but just something coupling that high voltage into the uh, PFC control circuit uh, that uh, uh, would be a good thing because then we would just have this simple hopefully simple fault where we've just had a huge energy dis energy discharge in some devices that are not made to handle it more light of BC556's desperate times call for desperate meshes into the scrap pile we dive uh, I think I see one TSA 1268 check the specs BC556 100 milliamps uh, collector and base and this thing's 100 milliamps collector and base high voltage pretty much the same gain range I think we're gonna be fine oh dear oh dear oh dear this has very quickly turned into an absolute clusterfuck uh, so I've started digging into the whole circuit area and pretty much every semiconductor and resistor around here say so for a couple of diodes is blown uh, it's all uh, congruent with uh, how you would expect it to fail if you had a sudden voltage spike on the point we saw. Uh, I've taken the liberty of uh, actually removing the little uh, test pad which uh, seemed to have caused the entire uh, problem to begin with. It's just uh, entirely removed now. I heated the, the pad and scratched it off with a knife just to prevent any further failures. But uh, that digging for a new transistor isn't going to help us much because I'm going to have to throw in a, an order apart for this thing because that's just so much shit blown. It's got a couple of rather weird uh, transistors, they're called a ZTX something or the other. And uh, this actually failed the last time I had this thing apart. Uh, so I figured, oh yeah, I probably ordered a bunch of them. But no, in my infinite wisdom, I ordered one of each. So I've got none to replace them with. And super specific. I don't quite recall how, but they are. So, got to put in a Mesa order and get back to this thing at some stage. But for the time being, I'm just going to keep digging away and getting all the bloody parts figured out. What a bother. All right, I've been going through the schematic and pretty much just uh, picking parts which uh, I think it would be likely to be damaged uh, by the failure mode we've seen here. I'm, at this stage I'm pretty sure it's been some kind of contamination underneath a piece of, B, piece of wire, uh, some insect, something which has caused the horrendously strong flush over there. So uh, if we have a uh, go through it, so uh, again the issue was we had a flush over from here which is uh, a roughly 400 volts, 380 volts uh, supply down to uh, this point which is uh, just a random part in a circuit which is uh, running off a stabilized 15 volt uh, power supply. So it's not, uh, I said this was the PFC circuit, it's not really. Uh, the PFC circuit is uh, this thing here powered by this uh, giant uh, I see which you can't get anymore, so I really hope that's not fry, but I don't think it is, thankfully. Uh, what uh, this uh, fried circuit down here is, is uh, the driver for the main switching transistors, which are uh, that guy there, uh, Q7, and this guy up here, Q4. And these guys uh, individually drive a transformer to produce the two uh, output voltages you get out of this thing. They're very isolated, very independent and separate, and this, this thing is a big box of magic for the most part, but that's the gist of it. So, uh, since we had the strike here, it, it was a positive voltage strike, it wants to go to ground, and uh, we've got ground here, this is indeed the same ground as we've got on the 400 volt rail 
uh, because this is the grain point for the 400 volt rail coming off a rectifier, you can see there. So current's obviously gonna first jump uh, through uh, this resistor, this capacitor here, down into ground, so these are all gonna be in wonky shape. Uh, then it's gonna go through this transistor because we're gonna have a 6.6 volts pretty much voltage drop to ground there, which is why that's uh, entirely open circuit actually. Uh, then it's gonna go through this transistor since it can just leave through there. And this is the one that's blown up completely. Then it's gone through this 220 ohm resistor which has gone open circuit and uh, just uh, knackered these two guys here as it's traveled into the 15 volt rail. Uh, and uh, I'm hoping after that, the ESD protection in the 7815 producing that is just going to have shunted the rest of the energy down to ground because we've got a couple of big decoupling caps around there. So fingers crossed it hasn't taken much more out. Uh, but uh, we still have a path to ground for the strike going through the 220 resistor, through this uh, serial ohm jumper here, into this logic gate, a 4069 and uh, from there it can obviously go through the ESD diodes to ground and to VCC and then to ground and so forth. Uh, so I've ordered this to replace it and then I've ordered the other logic gate as well uh, just for good measure because these are obviously interconnected they're generating the whole drive for the whole thing you don't want to have a wonky one. Now I've measured around a fair bit in this circuit and most of the resistors uh, seem to be okay they're jelly in any way so I can replace them when I get to got all the parts ordered and control issued it and uh, most of the di all the diodes actually seem to be okay because which is very good because they're kind of weird not your standard diodes there's some really fast things so I'd probably have to put some uh, TO220 switching diodes in there instead because I can't really get them uh, so I'm hoping we're gonna be able to fix this thing by replacing uh, this guy, this guy, this guy, this guy this guy, this guy, just for good measure, because I'm ordering them uh, this logic gate, this logic gate, uh, this uh, 7815 here, and uh, did I say these two guys? Those guys are going. Uh, now there's another path, it can, can, it can actually, if we're really unlucky, uh, it could have uh, taken a shit on uh, Q7 here. Uh, because uh, you can see uh, there has been uh, this resistor was blown and that goes to point G18 there or G1B I have no idea it's too low rest uh, and uh, that comes out here going to the uh, one of the power pins I've got I'm, I'm so bad at my fat designation for the uh, drain or source on this thing uh, but uh, it's not gone to the gate, it, it seems to check out fine in circuit, so I'm just going to hope it's fine. It, that, that's, again, it's, that's just a switching transistor, so you, I can put pretty much anything in there from some old power supply and it's going to be fine. And uh, the I think I've checked the passives around here and they've been fine. And all the diodes around this area check out fine, so I think I don't think the energy has really gone down here. It's gone through the 330 ohm resistor. Uh, where the hell are we? It's gone through this 330 ohm resistor into G1B, G18, and then it's gone through this 0.22 ohm resistor down to ground there, uh, just taking out the 330 ohm resistor in the process. So that's my train of thought, uh, that's uh, what we're going to do, I'm going to be waiting for parts, I need to check with my brain if I want to publish this at a moment, or if we're going to wait. So possibly, thank you for watching, cheerio, otherwise stay tuned for the proper repair. Welcome to two months later and we've got a decent pile of parts, which uh, I'm just going to painstakingly mount onto this board and you guys get to jump cut to our first test. Alright, I won't grant you that fantasy because I actually want to give you a, a bit of a comment on this particular revision of the EX752 power supply because it just bothers me. Uh, look, uh, 
uh, there's a bit of story behind this. Uh, this unit was worked on by a novice uh, repair engineer, like uh, an intern who wasn't too good at soldering. So we have got a bunch of failed pads around the logic circuit, part of the primary side of the power supply. But it's not entirely the fault of the novice because these tracks are just way too thin for no apparent reason. Uh, just look at how ridiculously thin this track is going between there. That's just asking for failure because you've just got so little material there to make up for any uh, inaccuracies during manufacture or issues when repairing it or just general non-optimal things. And uh, another thing about this particular PCB is that the pads actually are rather prone to just falling off. The tracks don't seem to be attacked down quite as well as they could be. So the result is we just get these uh, uh, padless holes where I just have to bodge in a whole bunch of mod wires uh, to make up for something which really could have been avoided if they'd just chosen to use slightly wider tracks than they have. We could just, here, look at that. There's no reason that track could not be three times wider than it is. That said, this is a very old unit. They still sell the EX752, but the new version is uh, entirely SMD. Well, for the most part, anyway. And hopefully, they've uh, remedied that issue in that one. All right, I've now replaced a whole slew of parts in this thing, including all the transistors here by TX1, a resistor that one ex had exploded, and the logic gates on the other side of the board, which certainly proved to be quite a bit of a challenge to actually wire up. I also replaced the 7805, providing the regulated 15 volt supply rail for all the logic, since that had gotten a big, big zap out of a 400 volt spark over. Uh, and I also replaced a couple of ZDX758 transistors in a kind of unrelated circuit just because they've been sitting there for a long time and I've ordered some new ones anyway because they're kind of difficult to get your hands on. I also replaced the two switching transistors just in case we got a high voltage on the gate of them. I do not trust them to be in good shape and it would be entirely pointless to just power it on, have a leakage from gate to source or something on these switching transistors and have the whole thing explode again. So, I think we're ready to give this a test. So let's just flick this on, we're not entirely connected up to the grid yet, and flick the main switch and see which color smoke comes out. And it's powered on drawing 4 to 6 watts, which is, I think it's pretty normal. I think this might not be on fire. Excellent! What a relief! Now, I actually am somewhat concerned about the power dissipation of this unit, because I just had a, a quick jump over to work, and uh, we've got one of these here, there. Uh, it's a somewhat newer unit, uh, but it's only drawing 34 watts while sitting idle in the same mode and no load. So I'm a bit skeptical about this, because if we leave it running, uh, we actually seem to be having unreasonable power dissipation in one of the components, namely R20 here, the big green power resistor uh, by the switching transistors. Now the purpose of this uh, resistor is to dampen oscillations uh, uh, over, over a choke which is uh, providing some uh, energy recycling from uh, losses in the transformer. It's a rather high tech circuit and I'm pretty much just quoting the manual. But I think something's up because it's running about 100 degrees hot now. I don't think that's right. So there's a couple of things which you could cause this. Uh, it is dumping energy into this 400 volt blue capacitor and that could be having issues. Uh, what could also be causing issues is if the PFC circuit is not providing a decent boosted voltage because we, we could potentially have an, a voltage across this blue cap which is higher than what we've got in the big rectifier cap and uh, they're basically coupled together. So we would have a lot of current flowing 
through this resistor into the big power rail. So we need to get this board back out of the device and make sure that the PFC boot circuit is actually doing its job. All right, the PFC boot circuit is supposed to be putting out about 380-ish volts, and that's across this big blue cap here. Uh, it's rather easy to measure. We don't even have to take the board out because we've got a couple of big repair resistors, 39K on the other side of the cap, uh, R94 and R39, uh, which are in series across the uh, voltage. So we should be able to measure about 380 volts across them. That's primary side, ouch. And that's a fine boosted voltage, 391. Excellent, that's not our issue. Hmm, well I've done some further digging around and I really can't find anything horribly wrong with this unit still. So right now I've actually coupled it up and it's uh, running with no front panel attached and I'm probing the temperature of that one rather hot running resistor. I can't find a proper data sheet for it but it is specified for 4 watts and we're seeing a temperature that's uh, stabilized at about 150 to 170 degrees C which is unlikely to rise when the unit is loaded down due to the application it's installed in and many of the data sheets I found for similar resistors a hint at a temperature rating of about well 350 C and we are nowhere near that. The lowest temperature rating I've found for any power resistor has been 175 so we really are quite safely within the specification of this resistor. It's going to be a brand name resistor, so I wouldn't expect anything less than 250C rated. So I'm almost tempted to uh, put this unit uh, back together and actually give it a go. Uh, nothing except for that resistor is running horribly hot. The uh, switching transistor heat sinks are rather hot for a bit 70C, but these always run hot. I've it's one of the issues I have with this unit, but it's required since it's cooled by a convection and tile. There's no fan. So these have always been sitting at 70-ish C. Pretty much all the heat sink in this thing when it's running are at about 70-ish C just to get the airflow going. So, oh, it's one of those uh, grind your teeth moments where I really... I don't like what I'm seeing. But then again, I'm not sure I ever would have liked it if I had checked it uh, when the unit was working as it should. Uh, the unit I have at work, which I compared the idle power consumption to, uh, is 10 years in year. I know that it's got a different PCB to serve its main design, whereas this one's an almost entirely through hole. So there is a decent chance they've actually done, made some changes and uh, made it more efficient with time. So everything's hinting at an idle power consumption of just over 40 watts, perhaps not being all that critical, especially since the resistor does stabilize at 160 C. It isn't rising beyond that. So I think I'm just going to kind of cross my fingers and uh, put this together in the case and run it until it explodes again. All right, and I think I'm starting to calm down about the resistor situation because I've got it back in the case. I've had it loaded down rather close to the maximum output this thing can achieve. And I also found another similar resistor, similar wattage on the secondary side, which is running just as hot under heavy load. So I really think the behavior we're seeing on the primary side is normal and uh, this thing is just built to run rather hot. Phew, what a relief. So finally, I think we're gonna be able to calibrate this thing and get it back in service. Uh, if we grab the IR gun and uh, measure around this, uh, we can see that it's uh, performing firmly quite as it always have. The heat sinks are running at about 60 to 70 degrees and that's uh, consistent for all of them. So these two guys here are the uh, switching transistors for the primary side and these are the guys who would be endangered uh, firmly if there was something wrong which would be causing issues with the uh, tanker resistor there which I was afraid was overheating but 
really they're performing quite as they should. So, phew, this is an excellent result. This one always runs hot in the 4 amp mode. G is almost 100 C there. Switching transistor on the secondary side. But I am very confident that there's nothing wrong at all on the secondary side of this unit because uh, the failure mode we saw on this was the failure of this converter down there. And that's the driver for the gates of the primary side switching transistors. So when the unit exploded, the only thing which happened as far as the secondary side is concerned is that the power went out because the primary side gate drives, uh, the primary side switching MOSFETs lost the gate drive and they just failed to pass any current through the switching transformer. And thus the voltage just kind of sagged down as would happen when you just turn off the power. So with all that out of the way, let's calibrate this thing because the display has been out for a while and enjoy the power supply I've become ever so used to. Geez, I should be getting a sponsorship from TTI given how much exposure this thing's getting in all my videos. All right, so calibrating this unit is a bit of a handful. Uh, thankfully, I've ch uh, quickly checked over all the voltage calibrations and uh, the voltmeter seemed to be pretty much in spec or everything for that seems to be just fine for both channels. However, we do have an issue with the current calibration for the uh, right-hand channel. Uh, because it doesn't seem to be able to quite regulate below 50 milliamps. Uh, if we drop the voltage low down enough, uh, it will provide low currents, no problem. But the current limit, uh, the, the lowest setting is 50 milliamps and that's wrong. As you can see on the left channel here, it's supposed to be able to regulate down to 10, 20, 30 milliamps all the way down to pretty much nothing. So we definitely have some kind of issue here and this has been brewing for quite some time. You know, it started out with not getting below 10 milliamps and it's just slowly been climbing up with time and uh, now it's turned into this. I don't think it was this bad when I put it away so it could just be a dirty potentiometer or something but we're gonna go through the current calibration routine anyway. So the gear I've got hooked up here is my uh, BM869 multimeter is in current mode in series with the output which in turn is going to uh, my 8 ohm load which in turn is in series with my adjustable uh, data logging uh, fancy PC controlled constant current sync which I've adjusted for 2 amps for the initial testing as per the service manual for the EX752. So this means that we have pretty decent uh, control over how much current we're uh, drawing out of this thing. Uh, the way the current sink works is uh, if it can't draw enough current it just turns into a straight short, meaning that we've got a 16 ohm resistor across the, the output, which is pretty useful. Uh, the reason I'm not just using the constant current load but I've also got the resistor is because the constant current load can't handle more than about 20 volts without going up in flames and that's not very useful when we've got a high voltage power supply and the manual actually specifies the use of a rather high testing voltage. Indeed I've actually got this little yellow meter hooked up just in order to make sure the voltage across the dummy load doesn't go too high. I don't fancy changing output resistors in that, I really don't. All right, so with all the gears set up, let's read the manual. So to do a current calibration, step one, switch the output off. It is indeed off. Set the output voltage to nominally two volts. Do it like so. Set current control to minimum. That's minimum. Connect the DMM, set to amps and load in series across the output. Switch output on. Then we are supposed to adjust VR8, or in this case VR108, since it's the right hand channel, and uh, adjust for a reading of 0 0.003 amps, plus minus 0 0.001 amp. And make sure the CT LED is on. So we're clearly way out of spec on that. So let's twiddle the knobs and see if we can get this working. Uh, there we go, I think that's about as good as we're going to get it and I think that's probably remedied the biggest issue on this thing.
And for the next step, we're supposed to increase voltage and current control to maximum. Adjust, adjust the load until the digital multimeter reaches 2.00 amps plus minus 20 milliamps. Adjust VR107 until the amps display matches the DMM. So let's just turn this up. I believe I've got my load set to 2 amps, so we'll just max this. And I think we can get to somewhere around 40 volts uh, before we run out of the headroom on the load. So we're supposed to have a reading over 2.02 at this stage, so we want to adjust ever so slightly. Uh, it's easier to do in constant voltage mode since we can get so precisely 2 amps of so let's fiddle with VR107 to get this to just about 2.00. Well, that seems pretty spot on to me. So this should now scale down quite well. That's looking quite spot on. So that is perfect current regulation and measurement. Excellent. That's better than this thing has been in years. Alright, and for the final adjustment, we want to adjust VR104 to adjust the maximum current output. So we've got the current limit set to maximum there for 2.05 amps. I'll just turn this up until we get to the current limit, like so. And uh, I've actually got the load set to 2.5 amps, so it's just going to sink more than this thing can supply. That's VR104. Twiddling that quite fiercely just to get rid of the oxide. So I have to raise the voltage ever so slightly to get up to spec. 2.04, 2.05. The meter's right, that's right, everything's fine. CCLD is on. Perfect. And for the final point of calibration, we are adjusting the uh, differential gain of the uh, pace supply, which is essentially adjusting its output uh, uh, regulation. Uh, so we want to uh, adjust it to 18 volts on the output. I note that I've reconfigured the meter for measuring volts. And we've got no load connected at the moment. Well, a very, very small one. Just the idle of the load. And what to note this uh, voltage here, 18.048. Now I want to turn on the load and uh, adjust VR10, what is it, VR109 until uh, this just basically doesn't change. So let's see what happens. Well, that's load on. That's load off. Okay. That's, uh, that is clearly not in need of regulation. Ah, and there we go. Another pile of parts successfully extracted out of the EX752M. It's going to get a bit crowded in that bag if we have to keep it up at this rate. This thing's failed three times of this far and I've only had it for a couple of years, but rest assured it is an excellent power supply and I've got no plans on replacing it anytime soon. It's one of a few high power power supplies you can get today which are stupid analog, dumb and suitable for basic use by people like me. So I absolutely love it and the fact that I've got a service manual and everything for it just makes it so maintainable and uh, just sustainable that it's just a good device in every sense of the word. It's just a shame it keeps exploding, but we have eliminated one of the factors since I removed the two weirdly placed pads which caused the arc here, which blew it up this time around. Uh, who knows, perhaps that's what caused the, the failure the first time around as well, because it did have the same exact components blown once before. But that's not a problem we're going to see again, so I'm just going to have to thank you for watching. Cheerio!